Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here again. I love this church. I love being here. I think I say that every time uh, I'm here. Um, first, I wanted to say, are there, I want to acknowledge uh, Veterans Day today. Are there any veterans in the room? Put your hand up, or if you, if you want to, you can stand up. We would love to, yes, absolutely clap for them. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for your service. We really appreciate that. Um, and we're so glad to have you here today. Thank you for your commitment to our country. <laughs> so um, I'm starting the series about here. who am I? Who am I, right? Um, there's a lot to say about who am I. If you're looking at me right here on stage, you see that I am an adult Caucasian female, right? And you can observe with your eyes some things about me. They might tell you some things about me. And some of you might be looking at me and thinking, oh, Karen, Here's Karen. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Karen is a term that has now become associated with a, typically a white, middle-class American female. And she's perceived to, be as, perceived to be entitled or excessively demanding. Now, I don't think I'm a Karen. But, um, and first of all, I want to apologize too. I want to apologize to anybody whose name is Karen here. I did not come up with the term. It is just a trope that is now in our society. That is not something I made up. Um, it just is, and I'm sorry about that. But I don't, I don't think I'm a Karen. I know my name is Lisa. Um, and before I even open my mouth, though, when I go into places, people might decide what they already think I am or who they already think I am just based on my appearance alone. And um, there's nothing I can do about that. I just hope that people who get to know me don't think that about me and people who think that about me just leave me alone. So... Um, Please. <laughs> Anyways. Um, but what if I told you that every single one of us, every single human, uh, images something to the world, images um, something whether they mean to or not, and what they actually image to the world is God himself. Now, some of you might be thinking, Karen, I don't, I don't think that's true. I think that um, you, I know people in the world who don't care about God and don't image God in the world. They don't act like God. They don't behave like a Christian. They don't, um, they don't consider themselves Christian. They're actually atheists. They would prefer not to be associated with God. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how, I'm not talking about how they actually feel about God. I'm not talking about what they think or believe about God. I'm, I'm not even talking about how they, be, they behave or what they do in the world. Um, I'm talking about an aspect of their humanity, of your humanity, that you have absolutely no control over, actually. Um, our identity is not something that we actually get to define on our own. But people do try, don't they? We, it doesn't keep us from trying. Every human bears the image of God, every single one, and that's a reality that no matter how, how hard people try to escape it, they cannot. Um, this is not an idea that I came up with on my own. This is an idea that is actually out of Scripture, and, um, and we can look at God's Scripture, we can look at the Word to kind of understand our origin story, where we came from, who God created us to be, who God made us to be in creation, uh, to figure out who we really are. And it's really important that we understand Scripture, that we look at Scripture to see um, wh who, who God made us to be. So we're going to get right into it here. Um, and we're going to talk about how humans are unique among creation and special in the sight of God. I'm going to show you this through, through, the, um, through what I've studied. I've studied a lot of this text over and over again. There's so much that could be said about this text. Um, and I'm just going to try to cover a fraction of it because we only have so much time here. Um, but I know that Scott, Pastor Scott's going to try to cover some of it too over the next couple weeks. So I'm off the hook for all of it. Um, but it says in um, Genesis 1.26, we're going to look at this part of the cre creation narrative. And I'm just going to read it here. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all, 
and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw what he had made, and it was very good. And it was evening, and it was morning, the sixth day. So there's a lot to unpack here, um, but let's just start right in verse 26. It says, let us, let us make mankind in our own, own image. And I want to address this quickly, but who is God talking to when he's, um, he's saying us? There are some people who believe he's talking to the angels, but that theory kind of falls apart because nowhere in Scripture does it say that the angels are made in his likeness, and nowhere does it say that humans are made in the likeness of angels. So that kind of falls apart. And there's another hypothesis that God is using the royal form of we, like the royals in England. We do this. We do that. But that, that's not quite right either. In fact, um, the prevailing conviction among early church fathers was that God was talking to himself in the form of the three pers persons. We know that God is one in three persons. We know that there's God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. And here in Genesis 26, the us here and our here is indicating that God is speaking to the fullness of his divine creative power to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And what do we know about Jesus? If you're off the top of your head, he was both what? Fully God and fully human, right? Okay, so this is going on actually in the creation story if you think about it. Um, this was not, um, he, God was talking to all three of these people, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then he continues in verse 27, he says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So God creates all these amazing things in the universe, like separating the earth from the sea and all the fish and the birds and the animals and the plants, all the land and all of that. And God creates it all and he calls it all good. And then, um, then what does he do? And actually, there's something interesting when you read the Genesis narrative, the narrative of creation. When he's talking about his creation, he's talking about everything he created according to their kind. So if you, I mean, you, if you have your Bibles open, you can look. But in verse 11, it says, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in them according to their, to their various kinds. Um, and then if you look over in verse 21, it says, so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living moving thing with which the waters teem according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and it says let the land produce um living creatures according to their kinds livestock creatures that move along the ground the wild animals each according to its kind i'm 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 outlining all of them because it's important to understand that they are all created to their kind but when he gets to humans he says something different he uses different language he wants us to see that he meant for us to be different. So we get to this last part, part and it says, let us make humans according to our kind, in our likeness, in our image. This designates that humans are more like God than any other aspect of creation. Okay? He created humans, and then he gives them this directive to rule and to reign over all the creatures of the sea and everything he created. And that's when he says it's good. After he's created humans, and then he gives them the directive to rule over them. He calls it actually very good. Where every other part of creation he calls good, he calls this very good at the end of the day. So he created he gives creation over to humans for their enjoyment and their flourishing and gives them authority over all of it. And to help you better understand this text, I want to look at a word here for a second, the word image. I want to look at that a little bit closer. And um, in the image of God, he created them. The Hebrew word here is tselem. It's a word for a physical representation of a God. I'm not just talking about God, but like in the Hebrew language, it was a representation of a God, any God. The same word is used in different parts of scripture to, des to describe idols and created, created to represent false gods. If you look at Deuteronomy 4, I'm just going to read these real quick just so you can kind of understand what I mean. Deuteronomy 4, 15 and 16, it says, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether like a man or a woman. And then 2 Chronicles 23, 7, it says, 
All the people went to the temple of Baal and tore it down and they smashed the altars and the idols. That's the same word, Solomon right there. They smashed the idols and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. So another part of kind of understanding this text is understanding who it was written for. Sometimes I feel like I never knew this growing up. I don't know why, but like we just read Genesis and I never thought about like who it was written to. It was written in time at a time, and it was written to the Israelites. It was written to the Israelites who were coming out of Egypt and following Moses into the promised land, right? And so they were coming out of Egypt. In Egypt, there were idols everywhere. that People worshipped false gods everywhere. And in fact, even Pharaoh himself was considered an idol. Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of ancient Egypt, represented a god on earth. He was a mediator between the gods and the people and the supreme ruler of the country. Pharaoh was both king and priest, king having the same authority, according to these people, same authority as their gods, and priest being able to communicate the gods on behalf of humans and their slaves. So to use the same imagery here when we're talking about a tselem, to use the same imagery that these Egyptians coming out of Egypt would have recognized was only designated for gods or statues or things that represented the gods to say that they were that to the one true God for all humans were created to be this. This was truly countercultural. This would have been um, countercultural for two reasons, many reasons, but here are two of them. Because in their minds, the image of God or gods was reserved for royalty only, people like Pharaoh, and then also reserved for stone images to go and pray to in hopes that you could have right standing with God with the gods, the higher powers of the world. And the second reason is that when you look at ancient narratives that came out of other cultures of this time, both Egypt and maybe ancient Mesopotamia, um, whenever there was a creation story, um, humans were always a byproduct of war, of hate, of, or maybe even an afterthought. Um, in other stories, humans were created out of wars between gods, gods that warring for power, warring for authority, fighting each other, being jealous of each other. And then in one of the stories, one god rips apart another god and the humans fell out of the blood of that god, right? Like that's how humans were created. And in another story, they were just created because then the gods, once the gods created this world, they didn't want to do any work, so they needed slaves, so they created humans to do the work, right? So in every other creation story, humans are not the focal point. The gods created them out of these obscure, um, these obscure ways, and they were not valuable. They weren't considered valuable. But in this creation narrative, in this creation story, it is clear of the days one through six of creation that humans were the climax. Humans were the purpose, the goal. In this story, God created humans out of love and out of joy to rule with him, to rule with him over the rest of creation. So... <clears throat> This, was, this would have been mind-blowing to the Israelites um, to see the God, their God, to see that their, their God created them out of love and out of joy and not out of hate to rule and reign over the earth. And then on the seventh day, God rested. And this, yes, indeed does show humans that we are to rest and we are to take time to remember all that God's done for us in our rest and to point to him on that day of rest. But it, God also rested because he was done. He was done creating. The world was created for humans. So once he was, humans were created, he was done creating. And the intention was for humans to take over from there as representatives to rule and reign over creation in concert and in unity with God. So from there, they were going to rule with God. Uh, This was significant to them, and it's significant to us because it means that in a world that told these people that they were not valuable, that they were disposable, that they were not important, they were learning that their God created them to be the most valuable piece of creation, to be royalty of equal value, of equal dignity, and divinely equal in the sight of God. And this was the God they were leaving Egypt to serve. Like, what a better king to serve. But if this is the case, if that was the case, if this is the case, how did they find themselves as being treated like slaves and herd animals and invaluable where they were? And how do we find ourselves today in a world where overall human flourishing doesn't seem to be going super well, does it? 
We have wars, we have sickness, we have poverty, we have anger, we have loneliness, we have depression, we have inequality, we have racial tensions. We have drifted so far from the original intent of humanity and our original design. And how did this happen? Well, we all know really of the first fateful act that caused that, that started the downward spiral for humanity, don't we? In Genesis 3, if you flip over, um, we see the, the fall of man, the story of the fall of man, and I'm going to read it here for you. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals and the Lord God that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat of the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God did not say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of, eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened. So um, right here, we see the fall. We see what happened. And I don't have time to get into all the nuances of this text. Um, there are so much here. But one thing I do want to point to you is in verse 6, we see that the woman does something here. She has free agency over her life. And up until that point, she has lived in the garden with God and man, um, living together in community, creating together in this, um, in this beautiful garden with God. And then the serpent sets the scene. He highlights the opportunity to the woman to take her life into her own hands and rule like God instead of with God. She was already ruling with God, but by her choosing to take the fruit, it meant that she was choosing to rule independent of God. And then, without God's consent, without concern for God, out of concert with him, outside of the parameters that God set up to keep them in unity... Eve chooses self-promotion and independence from God. And men, before you are thinking you're off the hook, the reality is Adam was right there with her. And at this point, they were unified. So they were she was not making this decision in a vacuum. She was not making this decision alone. He was right there with her in this decision. So this is on all of us here. And as a kid, I would often mill over this story over and over in my head, and I would think, if I was Eve, I would have done it so different. I would have loved God so much, I would have never done that, right? Uh, we would all be in the garden still, because I would have chosen the right thing, but I know better now, don't I? Um, the truth is, if you or I were her, were in the garden, if we were there, we would have done the same thing. We would have chosen independence from God. I know this because I do this all the time. Maybe not always on purpose, but I've made decisions independent from God. I've been bitter. I've been mean to others. I've put myself first before God, before my family, before my kids and my husband. I've sometimes been reluctant to do good because it's inconvenient or I'm tired or I don't think that the outcome is going to be beneficial for me. Um, and I could go on and on. I'm not going to list all my sins here for you. But um, how about you? Have you ever been in a place where you've made a decision or acted in a way that's totally independent of God? In your thinking and in your actions? Yeah. As the first humans, Adam and Eve were representatives of humanity. They were representatives of all of us. And they represented us accurately. This is also who we are. We are people who choose to live independent of God. Just like the first humans, we are just as guilty, right? We have shattered our relationship with God and severed our connection to the royal bloodline. And we have sullied and marred the image of God on our own lives. And it's because of this that God had to throw Adam and Eve out of the garden. And we read about that in verse 3, 22. It says, the man has now become like one of us. That's, again, the same word there, the image of God language. Like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and also take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground for which he had been taken. 
After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Our connection to God was so broken and there was no way for us to fix it. And if you think Adam and Eve were apologetic right away, I'm sure there were some of them, a lot of, a lot of their feeling was apologetic, but I don't think they fully got it. And I actually think that there's scripture to support how they really were not done with their independent thought, independent thinking. Because um, if you look at verse four, um, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Um, I'm using the ESV language here because I think it communicates what is actually going on here a little bit better. Her language here of I have gotten or I have acquired or I have brought forth, and even the name Cain itself is the Hebrew word forgotten. This is evidence that she still believes she has attained some sort of level of the same power as God because she is able to produce a child, a human, like God did. Okay? And this is in contrast to actually if we, you read the rest of the chapter, you, hear the, you read the full story about Cain and Abel and how um, Cain killed Abel out of jealousy. And then at the end it says uh, how she conceived another child. And what she says about this child, it says... Uh, her son Seth, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel who killed Cain. And the name Seth actually is the word appointed in Hebrew. So she has had some sort of heart change as she spent some time in the wilderness outside of the garden. She's starting to recognize that the one with whom all authority lies is really God and she, not with her. Right? And sometimes it takes the harsh, harshness of the wilderness for us to recognize our dependency for God. See, if we lived in the garden forever, we would have continued in our independent thought, trying to use the things in the garden for our independent thought things. We would have tried to live in the garden separated from God, and that would have been torment because it would have been exactly the opposite of what God had created it for. And we would have, if we had access to the tree of life, we would have continued to do that forever. It would be torture forever for us. Complete independence from, from God. And so the way is broken. We can't get back to God on our own. But thank God, thank God, he knew this was going to happen. He knew that humans would make this incredible error. And because he loved us, at the beginning of time, he already had a plan for a way back to unity with him. For us to find our way back to him. And aside from Genesis 1 and in two other places in Genesis, there's nowhere else in Scripture where we see the phrase, the image of God, in the Old Testament. In fact, the phrase is not even reintroduced until the New Testament, and it's reintroduced in reference to one person and one person only, and that is Jesus Christ. I'm sure you saw that coming. Um, I have a, a quote here to help us kind of understand how to look at this a little bit different. In a book called Being God's Image by Carmen Joy Imes, she writes... For many of us, it goes without saying that Jesus is the image of God. After all, he is God. But if we view his status as God's image primarily as a feature of his deity, we will be missing the point. Jesus is not the image of God because he is God. Jesus is the image of God because he is human. His entry into human history is not plan B, but a culmination of plan A. Jesus is and does what humans were meant to be and do. The difference between the way Jesus lived his life and the way that we live our life is that Jesus never stepped out of his role in creation. He was never independent of God, and he never made a decision outside of his unity with God. He lived a perfect, sinless life, being the example and the representation of God as both king and priest to show the world God's power and blessing over the world and to us. And um, Paul writes a lot about this in his letters, um, but specifically we're going to talk about how he write, writes about this in Colossians. If you look at Colossians 1, we're going to start at verse 15, um, and I'm just going to read it actually out of the NLT version because I really appreciate the, the, the simplicity of that for this text specifically. It says, um, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Same language here as in Genesis 1. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't. 
such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. And everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Jesus is the agent in the hands of the feet of Jesus and the, er, of God in the creation process. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme, firstborn over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For in God, all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. There it is. There's the key. God in his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him reconcile everything to himself. How did he reconcile everything? How did he make everything right? How did he fix the problem of sin in the world? Um, how might we have unity with God again? It's through the blood of Jesus. Jesus took our punishment on the cross he gave himself as a human, as the agent of creation, who was the one who made everything. He was the only one who could fix everything. And by living a life that we were all supposed to live, he lived a perfect, sinless life. And he did this for many reasons, but two of them are this. One, to be an example of what it means to be united with God, so that us who have so badly lost our way have an example. We, needed to, we need to look at Jesus in order to know who we were meant to be and how we were meant to live. Without the example of Jesus, we would be on our own trying to fumble through it all. And secondly, he did this to make it possible for us to live that way again. If he didn't die on behalf of our sins, we would not be able to live in unity with God. We would not be able to follow him. We would not know even how to start. And Paul continues in Colossians in verse 21. It says, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless And as you stand before him without a single fault. What? Are you serious? I can stand before God without a single fault. Gosh, I know myself and I know my heart. And that is really remarkable that I can stand in front of him without a blemish. It's amazing what Jesus did. When you put your faith in him, when you put your trust in him, when you believe in him, what he did on the cross from you, you are now united with Christ. And the cool thing about this is, is not when... When, God, when Christ was on the cross, it is not as if your sins were on the cross. Your sins are on that cross. They were on that cross, and Christ died for them. And now when God looks at you, it's not as if he is looking with Jesus. We are united with Jesus. He sees Jesus when he looks at us. This is astonishing. It's amazing. It's remarkable. And gosh, we couldn't do anything to do this, but God made a way for us so that we could live this way, so that we could be united with him. It is so cool. So our humanity failed. Jesus succeeded and wants us to succeed with him by placing our faith in Jesus. So if you haven't put your faith and love and trust in Jesus yet, this is for you too, okay? This is for you who are lost and confused about what your identity is and who you should be in this world. Christ made a way. He's ready for you to receive it. All you have to do is say yes to him. Don't wait another day. There's so much to be gained and everything to be lost. Your sin, your shame, it's all there to be lost. You can relieve yourself of it if you just put your faith and trust in Jesus. He wants you to unburden yourself from it and bring it to him so that he can put it on the cross along with the rest of our sins. None of us are perfect. So, and it, we have this unique gift that God's given us. And we are now kings and priests to the world around us. We get to be the kings and priests. We are back in unity with God, and he means for us to represent him in this world. We get to be the kings and priests, showing the world a different way to live, a way that doesn't depend on our individual ability to make thing right, things right, but it fully depends on God's ability to make things right, and he wants to use us to do that. He wants to use his people as a living example to, of his power and blessing over the earth. So if God is all about love, creation, life, peace, rest, 
then those who are actively opposing gods are agents of the opposite, aren't they? They're agents of hate, destruction, turmoil, and unrest. They don't want you to understand your true identity because your true identity, when you are united with Christ, it is a threat to their attempts to overthrow him. It is a power that they do not get to have. We get to have it when we are united with Christ. They want humans to believe that they are an accident, that we're some sort of cosmic anomaly evolving from some space goo that landed on our planet years, millions of years ago. The problem is that wherever humans go, there it is, God's signature, whether they like it or not. It can't be erased. It can be scratched. It can be marred. It can be mutilated, and it can be smothered in sin and hate, but it is never erased. Reminding those that hate God or those that don't want to believe in God that he is inescapable in life. There will always be tension within their hearts where eternity is actually inscribed to push away and deny the God whom they image in the world. It's like their stars shining in the night sky, shouting that there is no such thing as light as they emit their brilliant rays. They cannot escape it. And every time a baby is born, a new image of God enters the world. No wonder there's so much effort to devalue life in the womb. People against God do not want to be reminded of the miracle of life because it is proof of God. It is a reminder that there is a creator and he is still creating beauty in life and order through humans. He cannot be stopped and he cannot be defeated. So who are you? Who are you? I just told you a lot about who you were created to be and who you might or who you could be. You are the image of God in the world, whether you want to be or not. Are you someone who is going to rule like God? Or are you somebody who is going to rule with God in this life? Ask yourself this question. As the image of God, are you somebody who will rule like God, taking agency over your own life, unconcerned with the work that God has for you, the things that he's created you to do? Or are you someone who wants to rule with God, striving to submit to his plan, diligent to bring order to your corner of the world, creating room for other people to flourish? And by flourishing, I don't necessarily mean the good life that's usually associated with economic stability or prosperity or a great social web. Being united with the Father and being about his work do not produce the sort of good, did not produce that sort of good life for Jesus or the apostles. Now, it could produce that kind of life. I'm not saying that's impossible. But living as Jesus did does not actually promise that outcome. Having the sort of good life can actually put us right back in the seat of Eve. Like if we had stayed in the garden, we would have continued in a dependent thought. If we have all of the things that um, consist of the good life, as society would tell us, we might actually find ourselves back in the seat of Eve, tempted to be independent of God because we think that we've created a perfect world for ourselves. So having all these things is not necessarily a blessing unless we have it, submit, it submitted to God entirely. <clears throat> we can be connected with God to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That is our intended role. That is our goal. To be able to show the world a difference, to be able to show people that there is a different way to live, to show them that united with God, united with Christ, is a better way to live a way that is desirable and a way that is actually more true to their identity than anything else in the world. We get to show them themselves by living as Christ. We get to show them their true identity. Let's try to be that in the world. In a world full of people who live as slaves to chaos, doing what is right in their own eyes, be united with Christ Christ and diligent about ruling and reigning with him. Submit yourself to his authority. Put yourself, your faith, your trust in him alone. Do what is right even when it's hard. Learn more about life, the life and the teachings of Jesus by being, by being in his word and knowing what it says and knowing what he did. And pray often, knowing that you are praying united with Christ, that you are already united fully to him. I'm going to pray. 
Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, the truth that you created a way back 